Brandon. I'm one of the neurosurgery PGY1s. Uh, I was uh, able to rotate over here uh, for a month. Uh, a couple of months ago, I worked predominantly with Dr. Warner, Dr. C, Dr. Katz, uh, and enjoyed my rotation and uh, thank, uh, thankful for the opportunity to come and present. I have a patient at Dr. Warner's that I'd like to present. A uh, 49-year-old male, uh, had a history of anxiety, bilateral cataracts, diabetes on metformin. He also uh, likes to have a good time. He drinks uh, 10 shots of liquor a week, which I think is probably an underestimation. He's a pack per day smoker. He was in New Orleans uh, visiting um, uh, in April of 2018. He got in a drunken bar fight. Uh, he sustained a Spartan kick to the chest as part of that uh, encounter. He had immediate onset of chest pain following. Uh, he went to the local ER in New Orleans, which was fortunately negative for any kind of traumatic injury. However, as an incidental finding on his chest x-ray, you can see on the right lung about in between the sixth and seventh rib or so, there's this small pulmonary nodule uh, that uh, he was told about and told that he needed further workup for, uh, despite being otherwise okay from his trauma. So uh, he underwent a CT of the chest, which showed right hilar and subcranial lymphadenopathy. He underwent a bronchoscopy a couple of months after his initial presentation uh, and had an acid fast culture performed as part of that bronch, which was positive for multidrug resistant tuberculosis. So this guy's just all around really healthy. He was started on uh, linazolid, isoniazid, and moxifloxacin, given the multidrug resistance seen on the bronchoscopy culture. Uh, so fast forward to February and early March of 2019, so approximately uh, 10 months or so after he uh, had been uh, initially worked up and treated for the tuberculosis, he started noticing uh, visual changes. These changes initially manifested as colors appearing brighter, more prominent. He said specifically that whites and yellows were more prominent. This started to progress to blurry vision that progressively worsened to the point of within one week of initial onset that he was not, even, not able to see objects within even several yards distance from him. He notified the health department and said, I'm going blind, what's going on? They stopped his linazolid and isoniazid right away. And he had a full neurologic workup, uh, was admitted to the neurology service inpatient in April 2019. He had an MRI done, this is a coronal view, a T1 post contrast. You can see on the left optic nerve, there's a little bit of hyperintensity there. The radi radiologist commented said, we don't know if this is just vascular signal or if this is true optic nerve enhancement. So not really sure. He got IV steroids and was discharged. Um, you know, at, at this point, he had been off antibiotics for some time. Vision didn't significantly change with the IV steroids, at least noticeably within the first several days after that. He underwent a lumbar puncture, had elevated protein, otherwise the lumbar puncture was pretty unremarkable. His uh, CSF was negative for acid fast culture and uh, VDRL. Um, sorry, this text is pretty small, but um, essentially his exam, the visual acuity on the right, he was 20 over 150 on the left, 10 over 200 uh, when we saw him in clinic. Um, he had some subtle uh, mild edema bilaterally of the optic disc um, and some temporal exudates, uh, but otherwise, um, was fairly um, unremarkable uh, with the exception of his, uh, of his poor visual acuity. This was um, notably significantly improved since the antibiotics had been stopped. Uh, as far as his visual field testing, you can see here that uh, he has these uh, superior nasal scotomas uh, and sound patchy distribution of partial vision loss. That, uh, that was also um, improved from his initial onset. And I'll just kind of fast forward here. You can see he has some uh, mild edema bilaterally. Uh, you can see uh, there uh, based on his uh, OCTs. Uh, but I think what's important here is figuring out what the cause of his toxic optic neuropathy is. And he was on a couple of different agents that could explain this. And I think important, I didn't include this in the slides, but um, he had a full neurologic workup when he was admitted as an inpatient, including vitamin B testing. He was deficient in thiamine, which you know is not a huge surprise there. Um, so I, I think uh, given that these drugs um, affect, specifically uh, isoniazid affect the vitamin P, uh, vitamin B levels and, and the metabolic pathways that require vitamin B, um, I, my opinion is that that's um, the most likely offending agent, but we'll kind of get more into that later. So. Um, the adverse events uh, that are associated with isoniazid use include peripheral neuropathy, hepatotoxicity, and optic neuritis. Um, we give vitamin B6 to decrease the risk of these, although it doesn't entirely eliminate that, especially in someone like our gentleman who's probably just pan vitamin deficient. And his, uh, the, the visual fields classically take on the appearance of bitemporal hemianopic scotomas. Uh, that's classic, that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. 
Um, with uh, linazolid use, uh, adverse events include myelosuppression, peripheral neuropathy, and optic neuritis. So there's some overlap there between the two antibiotics. However, with linazolid, the difference is this is a relatively new antibiotic. Uh, the mechanism is unclear uh, as far as why it causes uh, neuropathy, but it's, it's thought to be due uh, to some form of mitochondrial metabolism disruption. Um, and since, as we all know, the optic nerve is highly myelated, has a high metabolic activity, that if there's some element of mitochondrial metabolism disruption, that, that would preferentially affect those highly myelated nerves. Um, and both um, isoniazid-induced and linazolid-induced um, toxic optic neurop neuropathy improve with cessation of the drugs. And here's kind of a time course from uh, a, a publication that I found regarding um, how the visual changes imp improve. You can see the visual acuity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. It, it does take time. I think that's the critical thing. If you stop the drug, it's not going to be like the next day they can suddenly see again. As you can see, based on these curves, um, you're looking at months to a year before you get your visual acuity back to baseline levels prior to drug initiation. And you can see that uh, that in this case, what I thought was interesting is, is that they, they used uh, methylprednisolone, uh, IV steroids, um, after cessation of linazolid therapy. Um, so uh, again, the, the steroids, if on the imaging as in our patient, there may or may not be evidence of optic nerve enhancement or there's some concern of, uh, of active optic nerve edema, IV steroids can be helpful. Uh, but really, the most important thing is stopping the offending agent. Just, just an interesting thing. That, did you see they, they marked that as Logmar? Did you, did you see that? And it actually has to be decimal. Because what's 1-0 Logmar? 2,200. <laughs> see, it says Logmar. Oh, so actually, baseline it's good Logmar is the reverse of that. Good Logmar is 0. 0.00. <laughs> and that's a decimal. Uh, that's all right. So uh, this is the first case report I could find, uh, I believe this was in uh, JAMA, uh, where isoniazid was first reported as a cause of optic neuritis and atrophy. So this is not a new concept, um, and in their initial report, uh, they, they reported two cases, bilateral optic nerve atrophy, um, and in both cases, discontinuance of the drug, brought reversal of the process. So this has been known about for decades. This is not a new concept, not surprising that our patient might develop uh, such deficits, especially in light of his, you know, medical comorbidities. Um, what is not as well studied, though, is linazolid. I, I was able to find a, a few case reports, really. There's not a whole lot of great information, um, given that linazolid is fairly new on the antibiotic circuit. Its mechanism, again, it, it inhibits the ribosomal subunits of the, of the mycobacterium that uh, inhibit bacterial translation. And so it's not really clear how that particular me mechanism affects mitochondrial metabolism, especially since that subunit is specific to the bacteria. But um, it's a similar kind of presentation uh, to the isoniazid-induced uh, uh, optic neuropathy. And uh, again, as I mentioned here at the bottom of the abstract, they experience initial rapid partial improvement and subsequent gradual almost complete recovery. Um, so again, that's, that's the key in these cases. Um, so, as I've kind of mentioned before, um, what's kind of interesting is that the isoniazid uh, specifically affects mycolic acid synthesis in the my mycobacterium, which indirectly interferes with the NAD and ADH metabolic pathway, uh, which can explain why these metabolically active nerve circuits would be preferentially affected. As I mentioned, not really clear how the linazolid affects uh, the mitochondrial metabolism. So. That's all I had, so thanks for having me on service, I appreciate it.